Garrett Ailey, and we're at the Inside ETFs conference in Montreal. Joining us is Mark Noble from Horizons ETFs. Mark, thanks so much for coming and talking with us. Great to be here, Pierre. So, Mark, there's been a lot of interest and chatter uh, in the last year surrounding active ETFs. What's your take on, on what's happening in that space? I think this year we're really looking at having, this is the year of active management. Now, I think I've been saying that for about three years now. Yeah. Uh, but uh, this year, it's, I mean, it's, it's really taken off. So when we talk about active management, you know, there's a, we talk about Canada being a leader in active ETFs. So there's about $80 billion globally in assets under management for actively managed right. ETFs. Canada represents about $30 billion of that. So wow. a huge piece of the pie. Disproportion. Uh, yeah, just yeah. massive disproportion relative to the rest of the market. Now, what's important to understand is some of that number is a little bit fudged in that um, the way that we categorize active ETFs from a methodology standpoint is an ETF not following an index. So there's some extremely large ETFs in Canada that are technically passive strategies, but yeah. because they're not following a, a well-defined index, they're classified in that active bucket. So it is probably smaller, probably closer to okay. sort of the $15 billion range. Uh, that said, um, over the last year, just a massive amount of new providers coming into the marketplace that are really doing true active management. So now we're talking about portfolio managers seeking to uh, beat the market as per se, or generate better risk adjusted returns. And so of this sort of 50 within, products, within an ETF within an package, ETF package. Yeah. this is a lot of this is your old school, you know, Trimark style uh, investment strategies that, you know, people have been familiar with for the last 40 years. Um, but the difference now is that they're trying to do it in an ETF package and they're trying to do it because, you know, the mutual fund assets for standalone mutual funds has been very poor sales. I mean, ETFs actually, a lot of people don't realize this in Canada last year outsold standalone mutual funds by a margin of two to one. Yeah. So mutual fund providers obviously recognize that in terms of a product structure, and it's similar to like music, right? If I, if I look at something like, you know, if I want to listen to the Beatles, you know, I just listen to the Beatles in a variation of different ways. I could have listened to it on record when the first came out. I could be listening into it a CD, but now I probably listen to the whole Beatles catalog on Spotify and I can listen to one song and follow it all the way into my car, right? The right. point is the music doesn't change, right? Same with invest good investment strategies, good active strategies don't change, but the ETF as a technology and delivery mechanism is really what people are looking to get into. So there's a, been a huge amount of launches, about 54 products this year, and of those, probably half of them have been this classic active Manage ETF. So, you know, I think I can say this is the year of the active managed ETF because that's sort of where wealth management dollars are going. So, Mark, there's a real uh, ideological debate going on right. here between the active and the passive side. And um, what's your take on, on the active ETFs? Just wondering. How do you feel about active ETFs? I know you, you guys have active yeah, ETFs yeah. and you're stable. I mean, selfishly, we have over, you know, roughly 45% of our assets, about $4.5 billion in true actively managed ETFs. But we also have another $4.5 billion but, dollars in benchmark. Sorry, just more yeah. specifically, do you counter the argument made by folks like Matt Hogan and Dave Natick about yeah, active do. ETFs? Right, because, you know, I think that they're looking at it from a very American lens. Right. So. In the U.S., first of all, there's not really an active ETF market. It's it's one percent of the product, but there's a reason for that as well. Actively managed strategies work best in non-efficient markets. So you know, so a lot of the academic ideas behind investing, which is you know diversification and depth of market, are what support indexing strategies. But you need market efficiency, you need a deep liquid market to support efficiency. So when we're talking about the capital markets in the United States, absolutely, indexing has far more application in that market just because of how vast and deep it is. Right. But when we look at Canada in particular, 30% of our ETF assets are in fixed income. And Canadian fixed income outside of the government side and maybe the high investment grade corporate side is not a very deep market. And it's certainly not an efficient market. It's an over-the-counter market tightly controlled by the dealers uh, with, you know, fairly, you know, thin uh, inventory. So an active strategy fits really nicely and statistically the uh, numbers bear out uh, that on the fixed income side, there's a lot more outperformance with consistency from fixed income managers and they're not doing anything particularly marvelous. Like if I look at the beta of their strategy and talk about beta, the correlation or how close they are aligned to the indices, it's pretty high. 
but they can do certain things like, you know, not being forced to buy and sell issues that, you know, have been downgraded but are still in the index, not being forced to buy and sell illiquid issues. So that it's, it's much easier for them yeah. to take advantage of the inefficiencies. Where if I'm looking at the S&P 500 or even the TSX Composite Index, you know, you're swimming with a much bigger school of fish and it's much harder to beat the market. So from an American lens, I would say that, you know, indexing is probably because of the cost advantages a lot of people are talking about expenses as alpha because of the low cost advantages you can make some you know serious uh, uh, alpha relative to active strategies using an index because it's just so efficient but when we start to look at these other areas of the market and in particularly Canada our fixed income local market there's a real place for active so now within the active space and uh, there are a number of emerging sectors that are sort of on fire right, right. now, marijuana, AI, uh, blockchain. What's your take on that? Well, I mean, it, it's, it's difficult uh, to, you know, have a call on it. I mean, I have, I have various opinions on some of those well, sectors. Well, it's very new. A lot of it's A lot of it's new. Of and let's not kid ourselves. There's yeah. a lot of risk in these sectors sure. because of high valuations. Now, I mean, long that's, where active, that's where an active strategy, like might might uh, bear out or, 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 or an index strategy yeah. so, um, uh, what I will say about these strategies is that uh, the thematic side what's driving thematic ETFs is historically when you get a sector that's emerging and let's type you know the two big ones right now marijuana and artificial intelligence automation they're sort yeah. of the two big hot sectors globally um, you know people have tapped historically would have bought the individual securities and you buy the individual securities and you get the sector play, right? We go back to 1998, we're buying Yahoo, we're buying Amazon, we're buying all these different stocks individually, taking on a lot of individual stock risk. Right. And I think we've grown up a little bit from an investment culture, understanding that, yes, there's probably something long term to this story, right? Uh, marijuana at some point, especially on the recreational side, will likely rival alcohol as an alternative. And if it does, there's real money to be made by these companies. But which one is going to be the winners? Same thing with artificial intelligence. We know that as we merge the digital and the physical world, taking data and applying artificial intelligence to everything from you know, smart cars to investment management strategies, you're, you're going to have some winners. But you don't know who the losers are. Right. And so right. why would you bet all of your eggs in that one basket? And this is where ETFs really come in. Because you can take an ETF and you get instant diversification to that sector play. So even though the valuations are high, you've eliminated the individual stock risk, which really in nascent or early stage uh, industries is really what can impact that. So that's why we've seen people buying these themes and their uh, vehicle of choice is ETF. So the right. fastest growing ETF this year in Canada has obviously been our ETF, the Horizons Marijuana ETF, biggest ETF launched last year. It's over $800 million, probably 900 as we get close to this new rally in the marketplace. And the valuations are very high. Like I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat the fact that you're paying a lot to get yeah. in these stocks. But people have a belief in the sector. That's their vehicle. We see the same thing with automation. The biggest ETF strategy globally over last year has been artificial intelligence and AI. And long term, you know, I, I think I could probably get most people on side that there's something to this AI and robotics theme, right? As we merge it. Yeah. But again, high valuations. Who are our winners? So people are opting for the ETF. So in the uh, in the AI space, um, what are some of the uh, names that are within the indices that that you're that that make up the uh, the ETF? So, so the big one that everyone watches and, and it is Nvidia. And Nvidia, the reason, okay. Nvidia, and in the automotive market, they're in the graphics everything. cards, they're in. And so Nvidia really caught lightning in a bottle. In that AI is a visual experience for for, for the for the most part. And what it is is when we you and I do something, or when we're traditionally using a computer, like if you go back to 1997 when uh, Gary Kasparov lost to Deep Blue uh, in chess, right, right. That was pretty amazing computing power, but it uses a CPU and a CPU is linear. So like, and chess is a perfect linear game, right? If X equals Y, then yeah. Y equals Z. And a, a CPU can process tons of information, but it does it linearly. The way that AI, the two, new deep neural network works is it processes everything in a lateral or peripheral way instead of a linear way, yeah. which means that it needs a new type of processor. So Nvidia about 10 years ago recognized that the GPU the graphics processing unit, while it doesn't have the, you know, it's like an F1 car versus, you know, 
a Honda Civic, they're both going to get you from A to B if you want to. Yeah. But the need for most people to go 220 miles an hour isn't necessary. And the CPU can do that. But the GPU, even though its end processing power isn't as big as the CPU, allows for AI. It can power AI. And of course, technology has allowed much more powerful GPUs. And NVIDIA took a huge market share earlier, and it's powering everything. If I want to do AI, I need to have GPUs. Same thing then in other stock is Kaons sensors, right? Yeah. And Kaons is a, a massive Asian company. And what they do is they build sensors. Well, if I'm merging the digital with the physical, it needs to interact with you and I. And I you know, it's not going to use, we hope at this point, it's not going to use biological body parts. Yeah. So it needs sensors, right? So it, these bricks and mortar pieces are really what's all the building blocks of our AI revolution that's coming upon us. We need these little component pieces yeah. to build this. So yeah, these it's are like, the stocks uh, are there. I, I think a year and a half ago or uh, within the last couple of years, SoftBank bought uh, ARM holdings exactly. entirely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a that's a chip maker whose chips are in every smartphone. You, exactly. Right. And I got, mean, these are the Internet of Things. This is this yeah. is the uh, yeah. the and, future. And I mean, son, and, Masayoshi's son has talked about the right. uh, the artificial intelligence taking over. Well, I mean, he's really the intellectual godfather globally yeah. alongside, you know, luminaries like Elon Musk. But on the investment side, you know, yeah, Mayoshi-san is really, he's led this charge. And now we're starting to recognize, okay, and it's similar to the internet, actually, if we go back 20 years, you know, what if I'm in the early stage of development, what do I want to buy? Do I want to buy the users? Well, if you bought Amazon, you know, 10, 15 years ago, you've waited a long time for these um, huge returns. Initially, in the early stages of technology, you want to be buying the bricks and mortar. You want to be yeah. buying the companies that are actually going to build the infrastructure for us to have this. And so that's where you're looking at. That's why I mentioned NVIDIA, Kionz, yeah. you know, Intuitive Surgical is probably leading robotics healthcare company yeah, where these, the these, Da Vinci uh, healthcare systems. Well. I, know, I always j joke, yeah. I'm like, there's probably a whole other side business of, you know, knocking people out so they don't see that robot above yeah. them when they're in the surgery. But, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see and it's, it's early. It. And it's, it's still early. very early. And that's very, why when yeah. we start something, we start from the ground up, yeah. we build the infrastructure. The same thing with blockchain, right? Blockchain is, you know, we believe the big winners in blockchain initially are going to be the, uh, the, the the semiconductors and the storage companies. And, and again, because... Regardless of who builds the are blockchain, are you talking about the the chip makers, the that, chip makers. that are making like Bitmain? That yeah, are making and, chips and again, for... I end up with Nvidia again. Yeah. But now you can like A A M D, uh, Equinix companies making yeah. ASICs processors that are used in Bitcoin pro yeah. and mining. Again, you know, are pure play Bitcoin companies going to be around three or four years from now? I don't know. But if we are, believe that blockchain is something that's going to become a rival to the internet. Let's the the infrastructure early stage again makes sense. So and these are the sort of things the ETFs hold. So now, what do you see happening in the Canadian ETF space in terms of the number of issuers, the size of the business? Where's it Where's it going in the next uh, little while? So right now we're in expansionary phase, but I, you know I don't want to sound like David Rosenberg yesterday. It was a, you know we called a scary story time yesterday at this conference. It's actually a wonderful presentation, but yeah, uh, sobering. Um, you know I think that the ETF space in terms of the uh, euphoria around its size is kind of at its height right now. Right. Um, and by that, I mean the number of providers. So if I go back to 2015, not a long time ago, two and a half years ago, uh, we were at 12 ETF providers in Canada. We're now going to be approaching 30 by the end of this year, uh, maybe even closer to 35, like it keeps coming out. Um, that's not sustainable from a product perspective. So the ETF industry is going to continue to grow at an exponential rate. That, that so, I have no argument, so, but the number of providers will likely contract from here. What's not sustainable about it? The What's not sustainable is that if you look at the sales flow in the ETF business, roughly 80% of the sales are sort of the top five or six providers. Okay. And so, and, you know, this is a profit-making business where you need your ETFs to reach a certain threshold for them to be profitable. You can probably only float an ETF from a capitalization standpoint, maybe three, four years max, if it has an extremely small so level scale. of scale. So scale. So, yeah. And so what's happening is, is money's absolutely going into the ETF industry, but it's a feast or famine situation where a small, you know, small group of leaders are taking the majority of assets, which makes sense from an investor standpoint. I'm looking at 700 ETFs in the Canadian marketplace. It's highly commoditized. I mean, we have I think we probably have about 15 or 16 S&P 500 ETFs in Canada. Right. I mean, it's, that's that's like, you know, 
buying your socks at Walmart or the that's Bay. A, that's right? a lot of choice yeah. for the same or, thing. Or, yeah. or, or trying to so find the right they, toothpaste uh, the that Lava was. Yeah. The so, differentiator's cost. Correct. If you're buying indices. Yeah. Differentiator's cost and to a lesser degree, differentiator's brand, right? I, I know these three or four providers. Yeah. They kind of give me the scale I want. The default is to move there. So for in order for new ETF entrants, and some of them will be successful, right? Sure. There will be some new entrants that are successful, but there's going to be a much smaller success rate than providers that would have come in six or seven years ago because, you know, this transition from uh, the fee-based advisors in particular, so, you know, what's driving ETF assets in Canada is a move towards fee-based advising in, in the IROC channel. Right. I mean, this is going to start to slow down a little bit too because a lot of this transition has occurred over the last two years. We've gone from sort of 25% fee-based to most of the dealers now have the majority of their advisors fee-based. And they're going to kind of find what they like from an ETF standpoint. So on a go-forward basis, the amount of assets that you're going to be able to drive, uh, you know, is likely going to, uh, you know, slow uh, from new providers. That said, new providers can come in with some interesting strategies. Maybe the, you know the next marijuana sector. If someone catches lightning in a bottle yeah. again, that could be successful. But I think we have to be ready for you know within two years a level of consolidation because this is a big space, but it's not big enough to hold thirty providers and seven hundred ETFs. Mark, it's great to see you here at the Inside fun. ETFs conference, and <laughs> thanks so much for uh, chatting with no, us. No, it's always a pleasure. It's been great to see you. Yeah, thank you.